Hello, and uh, welcome to our inaugural uh, Micron MVP webinar uh, broadcast. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the all-flash VMware Virtual Sand and Micron's uh, uh, reference architecture uh, results that we had when we first tested that out. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Wilkes. I'm a uh, market development engineer here, engineer here at uh, Micron Storage Business Unit. And with me online is uh, Doug Rollins, our uh, senior technical marketing engineer with uh, Micron Hello. Storage Business Unit. Hey, Doug. How you doing? Hey, couldn't be better. Good. Good to hear. Um, so I want to thank everyone here for uh, participating in the uh, in the webinar, in the web broadcast. Uh, I want to make this as interactive as possible. So uh, we will have some uh, poll questions that are coming up during the uh, during the presentation, and so please uh, take advantage of that. We want to get your information. Want to find out uh, as much you know from you as you're getting from us. Um, as well as if you do have questions from Doug, you've got one of the smartest guys at Micron uh, in this uh, web, broadca web broadcast, uh, please ask some questions and uh, we'll be able to get those, uh, get those answered for you as well. Um, Matt, but really before Matt, we get... Your two kind <laughs> remittance will be coming your way shortly. Yes, thank you. I'm expecting some flowers. Um, but actually, before we get started, uh, you know, I really want to, Doug. I just want to ask you, you know, why is Micron doing this? What's, uh, why would Micron be doing a uh, a web broadcast on uh, uh, virtual SAN? That's a good question, and, and that's really a good place to start. So, um, firstly, like like you noted, this is really highlighting some of the original research work that was done by one of our engineering teams whose entire group really specializes in VMware. Uh, when they first started taking a look at, at taking a look at vSAN some time ago, I think uh, the vast majority of them immediately sort of realized that vSAN w was, was a really interesting breakthrough new storage and virtualization technology. And looking at the baseline architecture, it really just it screamed to have flash have SSDs as its, uh, as its main storage. And then, you know, the natural next question is, that's all well and good, but why would Micron be interested, right? So that's about vSAN. And one of the key reasons is if you take a look, for example, at product breadth. Uh, if we look at how SSDs and basic SSD design has evolved over, what, Matt, the last couple years, the last three years, mm -hmm. we, we've really gone from, uh, sort of this design attitude of we're going to engineer one drive. It's going to work everywhere. It's going to be the best thing for everything. And we've we've really evolved that design and that philosophy to be more about uh, specialty design drives that are aimed really at specific segments or specific workloads. And those those specialty designs can run across multiple interfaces. So if you were, for example, to look at Micron's product line, and we're going to talk about a couple of them during this webinar, but it really spans the gamut from a host-based interface of PCI Express or dual-ported SATA or, I'm sorry, dual-ported SAS or SATA, um, really all available from one single source. So it's much easier in terms of qualification or procurement or ensuring that you have adequate supply. So really spanning the gamut of the interface, but also uh, Micron products tend to be uh, really engineered to meet specific needs, whether that's uh, a need for an extraordinarily high endurance with very low latency, because you have a very write-intensive environment that's the application is hypersensitive to latency, or you know, kind of looking at the other end, where if you have a highly read-focused workload that may be somewhat less sensitive, um, and everything in between. So if you look at both the interface the breadth of the interface is available as well as how drives are engineered around specific usage models. Uh, we offer all of that. So that's that's one of the reasons. Uh, yeah, another, I think that's a good reason. Oh. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying I think that, that is a good point that um, you know, it used to be that it was just the interface. That's how it differentiated between one type of flash storage versus another. But there's really there is a lot more to that, and and having that knowledge and having different workloads and usage models, um, it's not just the interface anymore. You're, you're exactly right, and there's a key advantage there. So back in, if we wind the clock, clock back uh, two, three, maybe four years, what, what we ended up sort of forcing the, the customer base to do was maybe paying a little more than they really needed to because if they have a highly read-focused workload, they don't need a drive that has an extensive endurance capability, which, by the way, also costs a little bit more money. 
uh, and so they had to they had to overbuy a little bit. Uh, that's been remedied. Uh, we've we've figured out uh, that engineering drives for specific usage models is is really the optimal way to go, and that's where we are today. And we'll talk about uh, two of those specific drives during the, the webinar today, where they each have very different characteristics. They happen to have different interfaces, but um, they're each very well suited to how they're deployed in vSAN. And you know, one of the other big differences, and one of the reasons that uh, you'd be interested in talking to Micron for your SSD needs is around media ownership. There's really uh, at least two different models available when, when it comes to designing, building, and supporting an SSD. There's those who buy the media, those who buy the NAND, for either on the open market or from a supplier or two, and they assemble a drive and they take those out to market. Or there's, there's kind of the other way of doing it, which is companies like ourselves that actually own the media design from its inception through prototyping, qualification, and manufacturing. And that's just the media side, right, Matt? I mean, then you take that, that finished media that was all done in-house, all tuned and tailored in-house, and then you can build uh, SSDs using that media. And, and again, you end up with not only this highly tailored, highly tuned product, but you have this support model that goes all the way from when the drive ships out in the field, all the way back through the drive design and assembly, and then further back through the media design and manufacture, but it's all from a single source. The level of knowledge and expertise is available from that one single source. And then lastly, you know, we're talking about vSAN today. So if, if one were to take a look at Micron's relationship with VMware, I think um, that the way that we work with VMware, which is engineer-to-engineer -engineer level engagements to ensure we understand how the VMware products work and what they expect of storage devices, and then we take that information, turn it around, and make it into better, better storage devices. You also see things like... Um, Micron's uh, public presence around public-facing engagements. I mean, you go to some of the VMUGs, right, Matt? Yes, I have. In and fact, so, we're actually meeting all the VMUGs this year. Every one of them. Wow. So, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to see Micron's presence out there in the public. Uh, anybody who was at VMware Partner Exchange or PEX saw uh, some of the material presented there, and, and some of the engineering staff was there. So, you know, there's at least three key reasons there. Breadth of product, breadth of usage model, end-to-end uh, -end ownership of everything that goes in it, and the very close working relationship and, and public marching hand-in-hand -hand with our friends at VMware. I don't know if that That's helped great. clarify or, or made it worse. I think, no, I think it well, at least, well, but I work for Micron, so it, it is clear for me. Um, but, you know, let's get started, because I think this is, uh, we do have some uh, uh, interesting test results, and the, the fact sure. that, um, you know, th this is one of the big evolutions for VMware's Virtual SAN, when they came out with Virtual SAN 6.0, was having an all-flash or an all-SSD uh, uh, configuration. And there is such an advantage of having that versus a hybrid solution. I think we've got some uh, details about that for this, uh, our initial test results. We, we really do. And as we go through this, uh, keep in mind, too, there will be a subsequent uh, follow-on to this, which is a reference architecture white paper that's going to go down into a uh, much greater degree of detail than we have the bandwidth of the, of the time to go through today. So those of you who are attending the webinar who are intrigued or interested by this, I'd really encourage you to keep an eye open. Uh, out on micron.com for when we publish the reference architecture, and it's that reference architecture is the basis for exactly what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, Matt, we've got our first poll question up. Uh, I thought we, what we would do is start out trying to help Matt and I kind of frame the discussion. So if you want to go ahead and, and intro that one. Yeah, so we know that uh, uh, virtualization, virtualizing your servers and uh, applications are uh, the, the the big wave, uh, and we want to find out just again, kind of get a feel from this group just of what percentage of your data center or your customers' data centers uh, workloads are virtualized. You know, how, how much are they actually uh, trying to do more with less? And on that one, uh, you're not really looking for a specific workload, right? It's just in in general how many just are in general. Virtual. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So yeah, uh, audience, if you can. Take just a second, and we've kind of broken it into four categories there. Uh, on the top, the less than 25%, maybe that's the uh, portion of the of the uh, customer base that's kind of just dipping their toes in the water, and then all the way to the other end. These are the folks who've jumped in with both feet. So, 
think we'll take a couple moments, let those come in, and then uh, Matt, let me know. We can go to the next one. Should we check our results? Uh, let's see what we've got so far. Oh, we're getting some... Uh, yeah, about half ready to give them one more... Click yeah, let's... Uh, oh, yeah, that's kind of... Yeah. Wow. So this is um this is good stuff. This this actually surprises me a bit. I'm 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 a little surprised at the fifty one to seventy five percent. Uh this is a good thing. What what this suggests to me is that the customer base that we're all talking to is um already already crossed the chasm of shall I virtualize. They've already picked very specific workloads which are optimal for virtualization and they've already moved on it. Does this surprise you at all, Matt? Um no, not not too much. I, I think some of the data we talk about just in other polls, it is around that 60% of uh, uh, um, users are virtualizing their data centers. And so we're going to hear at that crossover, we got 60% even of this group uh, has at least – this is like 60% has at least half of their uh, data center workloads virtualized. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Uh, that's good stuff. So one other quick one. Um, this is sort of a binary answer. Uh, just poll for the audience. Uh, does VMware currently support an all SSD architecture in vSAN? So to the best of your knowledge, is this an officially supported VMware configuration, all SSD vSAN or not? And Matt, if it's all right, I'll let you go ahead and do the monitor on that one. and. Uh, let us know when you come up. Again, we've got, uh, got 24% of attendees. Of, oh, now up to 41%. Give you one more. Uh, okay. And so, Doug, can you see what the answer is? Uh, I can. Let me just uh, go to the. Oh next no! Don't no! No! I don't just see what. What do you think the. Uh, what do you think? Uh, oh, I think I think the what do I think the winner is? I think the winner is going yeah. to be yes. Let's see. Yes. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah, that one doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, <laughs> that was one of the biggest deals with the announcement of vSAN 6, right? Where VMware initially did not support the all SSD vSAN. So this was a, a big, big change for our friends at VMware, where they officially signed up to support it. So this is good stuff, and, and it's really good to hear that the audience is. Uh, you know, almost 70% of the attendees have, are already in lockstep with that. So that's excellent. Okay, so um, thanks very much for helping out with those, Matt. Let's um, let's go ahead and get, get rolling on a little bit. For the folks who are not intimately familiar with vSAN, there's there's a pretty simple analogy we'll draw. But at the end of the day, vSAN is, is really partially focused on software-defined storage. And you think of this, we're, we're all really used to hypervisors, where we have this abstraction layer that sits between the physical hardware and the machine, the virtual machines that are accessing it. And that hypervisor, of course, sits right in between. Uh, we can think of vSAN as it's kind of like a hypervisor for storage. Uh, what this diagram shows is we pick some example applications. And, and you know, it's not limited to these four. But some example apps like uh, you know content delivery or big data databases, either a relational or NoSQL, HPC, and there's you know dozens and dozens and dozens of other workloads that people already have virtualized or that they plan to virtualize, and the storage requirements for those applications. We now have this storage hypervisor, if you will, that we show in the center there that sits between the, the physical storage over on the right and those applications that are running. And if we take a look a little closer at what we're showing, those are the, the SSDs that we'll be talking about today. So the Micron M500DC we use is the, uh, the, the back end store where the data resides permanently. And then the, the Micron P320H, which is an SLC-based um, SSD in either the card form factor or two and a half inch hot plug. That's the uh, the buffer where the the writes come in and get sta get received and then staged for uh, moving out to the M500 DC. So if we um, kind of peel the covers back a little bit more, this is sort of a visual representation of what we just described. So those applications over on the left hand side, they as far as they know, they're accessing physical real storage without going through that hypervisor. 
uh, and that storage is abstracted through the hypervisor where the applications really, uh, they don't see a difference between those large capacity SATA SSDs we show on the bottom and the PCI Express P320H that we show on the top. From the application perspective, it's really just one large pool of storage that's abstracted through that hypervisor. And then the, the vSAN is what takes care of managing the location of the data and placing it accordingly and sending acknowledgments back to the virtual machines and that kind of thing. So Matt, I don't know, is there anything else we wanted to touch on on, on this section specifically? I think Matt might be on mute there, so let's go ahead and uh, we'll move forward. So uh, that's okay. So um, we we've seen a lot of interest in vSAN. We've seen it across customer bases, across workloads, across usage models. There really is this this growing swell, and uh, I thought it, it might make sense to take a step back and and maybe look at some of the key reasons why customers are so interested in vSAN. And the, the first one is it's both straightforward, but you do have to peel the covers back a little bit. It, it really makes virtualization simple. Um, it's integrated into vSphere, so in terms of setup and management and setting um, what sort of failures and faults are tolerated, we've got this single pane of glass that we use to set up and manage it. Furthermore, we've got a built-in robust policy control engine that helps us automate some of that. Uh, some of the biggest deals, though, that really go along the simplicity line are the fact that it's self-tuning, self-rebuilding, and self-balancing, meaning if I'm an administrator, if I'm the vSphere administrator, and I've got multiple VMs running in vSAN, and I've got my uh, storage on the back end comprised of different SSD types that are designed and tuned for specific usage models and workloads, once I set it up, I don't have to do anything. It does it all itself for me. Uh, whenever there's uh, an imbalance, maybe maybe some of the storage devices are getting hit harder, it takes care of that. It does the auto rebalance for us. If we have uh, any sort of a failure from which we have to recover, the rebuild is automated. It just it does it itself for you. And as well as tuning. So all of these functions, once we set up our policies, all of this stuff happens for us completely transparently and completely in the background. Also, we can implement a per virtual machine service level agreement. And this is really important because often when we have these highly mixed workloads, and we're going to look at a, uh, a little bit later on, uh, a very mixed workload, but some of our virtual machines have to have a higher service level agreement. They have to have uh, response times that are better than other VMs. I mean, if we pick a specific example, I imagine that we've got a, um, a decision support system running on some of our VMs. And you know, typically, business intelligence, decision support, um, these type of reports query large volumes of data, do analytics on it, and we don't need the, the responsiveness to be guaranteed. We don't need the, those IOs to go to head of queue, if you will. On the other hand, suppose we're running uh, virtual machines that, that are running an application that tracks factory, uh, factory test data. And we need to know very quickly if we probe uh, things that we're manufacturing as they go down the line and we compare those, those uh, test results to what is acceptable from a design perspective, we need those responses back quickly so our factory can re react accordingly. In that case, you'd need a very good SLA. You'd need to ensure that your IOs were completed very, very quickly. But the big advantage, you get SLA support for each individual VM. Another good reason, the next one down, it's, it's really purpose-built. Um, you can choose whatever storage product that's qualified by VMware you want to use on the back end, and it's built into the hypervisor. So there's no extra bits to add on, no extra uh, software to manage or install, and that kind of thing. So as long as the storage devices are on the VMware HCL or, or their controllers are on the HCL, uh, the storage devices are qualified and work. So you can pick from within those lists. And then finally, if we look at scalability, I mean, we could start with vSAN being very, very small. And then as we move more and more work over into the vSAN, uh, we can continue to grow it by adding additional nodes. As we add nodes, it really is a grow-as-you-grow model. 
Um, we can have, we're adding horsepower, we're adding connectivity, and we're adding storage on a per node basis. And then as we grow that out, in aggregate, our vSAN gets larger and more powerful. But the big advantage with grow as you grow is what I just mentioned, very small startup costs. So we're going to look at an eight node vSAN running 32 VMs and a few thousand um, stimulus generators. And that's pretty good size. You don't have to start that big. You can start with far fewer nodes and, and really just add capacity as you need it. And then finally, the overall design is highly elastic. As we add nodes, we get both capacity and we get performance because we have additional VRAM and CPUs available and additional connectivity. So those are really three of the primary drivers, the simplicity of it, the fact that it's uh, purpose-built, it's, it's not a retrofit to something, and it's very easy to scale both up and out as we add nodes. So that's, um, that's kind of a little bit about, um, about some of the vSAN operations and design. Now let's shift gears just a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the all SSD vSAN in particular, um, both the how and the why, how one might do this, how we did this internally, and what we saw when we started measuring the performance of this vSAN and how, uh, how, that, how that all came about. So Matt, I think we have another uh, polling question up here. And then I want to do this one uh, pretty quickly. So just uh, click on here. Um, have you supported a, uh, a VMware Virtual SAN in the past? Have you tried to uh, install one or provide support for one? And let me know when we want to uh, move forward when you've got enough, enough responses there. I think we'll go to the, uh, you can move forward. Okay. Great. So uh, we have some that have, about a third, and about two-thirds that haven't. So uh, I think that's a good mix. It's about what I think we expected. So this is a single node in the reference architecture that we've been talking about. This will be in the white paper we have forthcoming. Uh, we used a Supermicro 1U. Uh, you can see the model number there and some of the key features and how it was populated. We chose this platform for a couple reasons. This platform is very readily available with a number of two and a half inch slots out the front. Um, this platform supported adding significant number of SATA SSDs as the back end store, but it also had enough open slots that we could add the card form factor P320 uh, in there as well. So, in each of the nodes in the vSAN, there's a total of eight. Um, we have these, these devices installed, and if we look at the vSAN in aggregate, the features, the uh, specs appear on the ribbon across the top. Eight nodes with a total of 160 cores. Across those eight nodes, we have a total of four terabytes of DRAM, 50 terabytes of storage, and 320 gigabits per second of network bandwidth. Uh, a recorded version of this will be available, so don't, don't sweat scribbling down all the details on what went into the Supermicro unit. Um, when you get the link, you can download this and take a look. The next slide shows uh, how these nodes are aggregated together. I mentioned earlier that we have eight of them. The first thing to notice is they're identical. All of these nodes have two of the P320Hs installed, and I think a total of 10 or eight or 10 of the, um, of the M500 DC 800 gig SSDs on the back end. So this is really just the aggregate pool of what the vSAN looks like on those nodes before. We're going to now move a little bit to uh, what we measured and what we observed, but some of the key things that are critical in terms of databases, the storage in a database has to have capacity and bandwidth, extremely low latency, and very good throughput for small transfers. You're going to see this used in both OLTP, OLAP, and those type of accesses. It really requires consistent performance. We can't have our users waiting on an app, and we can't have this wide disparity of response time. At the end of the day, really, the database performance is driven by the storage on the back end. So here's one of the tests that were run. This is a simulation of a brokerage firm. Uh, this is a TPCE-like workload that really focuses on a complex brokerage application where we're doing things like stock trades, account queries, stock purchases, uh, performance analysis, benefit analysis, and this kind of thing. Uh, if you look down at the bottom, you can see we were running uh, SQL Server uh, 2014 with 64 gigs of, of DRAM and six virtual CPUs per, and we uh, allocated about 700 gigs total of data for each of these. 
the TPC client, so this was the client that was generating the I.O., is obviously going to be much smaller, 8 gigabytes of DRAM, two virtual CPUs, and 40 gigs reserved for booting. So when we executed this workload against uh, 16 virtual machines running in our vSAN, we measured north of 220,000 transactions per minute. And what's really interesting over at the right, if you look at the consistent performance, we saw it's a very tight distribution of latency. So the application performs very, very consistently when it's run on vSAN. We also to look, took a look at web application database. So in this case, um, this was really modeling a website. So although it is more straightforward, uh, it does tend to be less CPU dependent, the, the I.O. itself is much more complex. So think about things like, um, you know, I have a shopping cart and I'm changing my registration data or I'm adding things to it and, and taking things away. For this part, we use MySQL uh, running in virtual machines, and you can see the configuration there at the bottom. Notice, too, over on the right side, the performance consistency. There's a couple outliers, but the vast majority of the IOs are very consistent and tightly distributed. So what's interesting is we ran both of these at the same time. So this study was not the brokerage firm first and then looking at the shopping cart. We ran them all together. And not only that, we ran all of the clients who were generating all of the IO also on the vSAN. So we've got 32 virtual machines, two very distinctly different workloads, combined generating more than a million transactions per minute, and the whole vSAN was less than 50% utilized. So this is, this is really a big deal. We're throwing a lot of work at this. We've got a lot of virtual machines running a ton of I.O. We have many stimulus generators uh, executing that I.O., but at the end of the day, the entire vSAN is only about 50% utilized. There is tons of room to grow in this 8-node design. If we take a look at what we, what we actually measured uh, when we were doing it, again, all, third, all 32 database VMs running simultaneously, uh, very consistent latency when measured at the VM level. So what we're showing here is in bandwidth and IOPS, the read and write ratio splits. But over on the right is what's really important. If we look at the, um, at the latency, you know, we're seeing at the worst case on our right a 7 millisecond latency. And we're seeing uh, you know, at, the, at the cache SSD and capacity SSD, the actual physical storage devices, the latency is much, much lower. What that suggests is the mass majority of latency comes from the application itself rather than from running it in a virtual machine or with flash on the back end. And I think that probably makes a lot of sense. So kind of starting to wrap up here because I see we're running towards the end of time. Um, why would we do an all SSD VMware virtual SAN? Well, simplicity is the main reason. We have commodity node platforms. Uh, we use super micro commodity servers, but really anything that's VMware approved you can use. We used uh, all SSD in the disk storage groups. We fronted them with uh, a card form factor PCI Express, and the back end was a SATA attached large capacity enterprise grade SSD. Performance wise, keep in mind that one million, one plus million TPMs that we measured, we didn't do any tuning on the database. There was no, no tuning done to try and eke out any extra performance. It's just stock and as is. I mentioned earlier we had 32 concurrent uh, database virtual machines and the IO was being generated by almost 5,000 clients also running in here. So, Again, we have a, a, a vast number of machines running to generate the I.O. Uh, below is a little note about what we measured. Uh, the complex brokerage firm was uh, measured about 220,000, a little north of that, and the website carts 850,000, a little north of that. And when all said and done, the all SSD vSAN running on these platforms with that workload was still only half utilized with sub-millisecond response time for the majority of the I.O.s. We only measured about 50% CPU utilization and about 50% of the DRAM was used. So what's next up? Uh, well, uh, the next thing to take a look at is, is go out to the VMware website. There's a hot link there. I'd really strongly suggest go out and take a look at it if you or your customer base has interest in vSAN. Uh, but it's really as simple as one, two, three. You want to enable the customer base, build the units, and then go. In terms of enablement, um, Really, vSAN with all SSDs is going to give you the best performance option with the lowest latency option. 
Uh, look for that reference architecture doc I mentioned if you want the next layer down of exactly how this stuff was built and connected together. Uh, the all SSD SAN does support all SSD vSAN does support the best growth option. Uh, again, we were less than 50% utilized in this eight node design. Build it. Just look at the VMware HCL to determine what SSDs you can use. Those that are approved by, v, by VMware are vSAN approved as well. And build it out on commodity platforms. Again, consult the VMware HCL when selecting platforms to make sure you have very, very smooth and easy support. And then finally, uh, take a look at the video there. This is some more detail about why the all SSD vSAN is really what makes sense. So that about wraps it up for me. I don't know, uh, Matt, if we had any other closing thoughts we wanted to leave the group with. Yes, yeah, so Doug. Actually, we did get one question from the uh, from the group oh, here. Oh, sure, sure. And so this was, uh, and I don't know if we can. Well, let's see. What, if, what do you have? Um, the question is, uh, how does this solution stack up against uh, an InfiniFlash uh, in terms of uh, cost and performance? It's a good question. You know, the InfiniFlash announcement was uh, relatively recent, so I don't know that there's a, there's a whole lot of track record or a whole lot of um, experimentation that's been done against InfiniFlash. I can tell you that one of the key differences here is we're talking about commodity platforms with um, widely available storage running through standardized interfaces. So when we're looking at the all SSD vSAN, that's one of the key enablers. So if we have a customer base, for example, who uh, likes Supermicro and has good experience with micro on SSDs, we can build that. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a customer who prefers, let's say, an Intel uh, EPSD-based platform or from a local reseller, system integrator, or local vendor, and they want to integrate uh, SSDs into it, again, as long as the hardware is on the HCL, uh, it, it, you're good to go. I'm not sure if InfiniFlash is there yet. It's really a different architecture. Uh, so it's not exactly a direct stack up. Um, in terms of which one ends up being better, uh, you know, I think it really depends on what the customer base requires. I mean, if they, if they want that external box and, and the uh, external cabling complexity for a specific reason, then maybe that's the best choice. If, if they like the fully integrated uh, very few U of rack space required, uh, this would be a much better design. So I don't know that it really is a direct stack up, Matt. Okay, yeah, I think that's, uh, I agree with that, Doug. It, it really depends if you're on the server side or on the storage side of yeah. that acceleration. Um, yeah, yeah, I think if the data is as close to the server as possible, that's where you get your best performance, and that's where a, uh, a VMware uh, virtual SAN solution using Micron technology is probably going to be uh, your best solution. I and couldn't agree the, the more. And the scale. Yep. You know, the, the closer you can get the storage to the CPU, the, the better off your customer is going to be. Okay. Oh, oh we've got some other uh, – oh, man, now we're getting questions. They're all popping in. Um uh, so oh, there's concerns about uh, all SSD for data reliability. Traditional users want to have backup for their data. Mm -hmm. It's a fair question. So I, I can really speak to the SSDs that were used in this reference architecture example. Um, if we look, for example, at the P320H, that's that PCI Express card form factor that's used uh, in this example. Internal to that device is a built-in RAID-like architecture which inside the SSD itself protects against complete and catastrophic media failure by using a parity protection scheme, much like we would have in a RAID 3 disk array. Uh, in addition to that, if a failure does occur, what the device would do is recreate the failed data from parity, move the data elsewhere on the drive, and retire the failed media. So it's, it's almost like uh, a RAID array with a built-in hot spare and an automated change out of the hot spare. Maybe that's a good example. But the point is, uh, there is inside the drive parity level protection, automated rebuild, automated uh, media retirement, all built into the drive, seamless to the end user. The drive used on the, the uh, capacity SATA tier has the exact same technology, Matt. It also has built-in uh, RAID protection. We, we call it RAIN. It's short for Redundant Array of Independent NAND. But it's a parity-like uh, mechanism. Uh, we don't use rotating parity the way disk arrays do because we don't, we don't need to. There's, 
There's plenty of performance inside the device that you don't have to rotate that parity through to try and keep performance up. That's why it's RAID 3-like. But you know, in, in terms of that, every storage device that we're looking at in this vSAN reference architecture has a built-in RAID-like data protection scheme. Well, Not only that, but in the... Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I see. I think that that's the whole advantage of VMware's virtual SAN is you have exactly uh, multiple yep. nodes that have that backup. Exactly. You can set a policy uh, where you can tolerate a certain number of outright incomplete uh, node failures. So you, you, you set that up and uh, you have to fault tolerance inside the storage, fault tolerance outside the storage, all built into the same, the same unit. Um, but one more question here. How about what's this solution compared to like an IBM uh, TMS system? Yeah, so uh, again, um, it's tough to make direct comparisons. So if we look at what used to be Texas Memory Systems, now owned by IBM, um, the last time I looked at a TMS product, it was storage only, whereas what we're talking about is completely integrated storage, integrated into servers, and using vSAN to kind of merge the two and make, make that completely seamless. Um, I'm, I'm honestly not really sure how one would use a, an external TMA-based unit to, to do that. I, I suppose one would treat it as conventional external storage um, and, and really deploy it that way. So I think it's, it's maybe similar to the prior question. It's not really a direct stack up to stack up easily compared um, between those two. Right. Yeah, thinking back to that, like I said before, it's having your storage as close to the server, and that's where mm -hmm. this VMware Virtual SAN solution works, um, as opposed yep. to having a Flash appliance of some sort, whether it's a TMS system or InfiniFlash. Yeah, you know, any of those external appliance type devices, I mean, they have unique value propositions too. I don't want to come across as being negative on them. It's just like you were just suggesting, the, the closer you can get that storage to the CPU, the better, the better off we're going to be in terms of application responsiveness and, and frankly, simplicity. Okay. Uh, it looks like that's it for the questions. Okay. Hey, well, again, um, thank, Doug, thank you. Sure. Thanks, and, uh, uh, we appreciate everybody, everybody's time and, and attending today and, uh, I can tell you that uh, this is, like Matt noted, just the first in a, in a series of webinars. Um, they're, they won't all be focused on vSAN and virtualization, right, Matt? I mean, we've, we've got quite the litany of topics planned for these, right? Yes. So, uh, so stay tuned. Okay. Well, um, like I said, I really appreciate everybody's time and attendance today. And uh, Matt, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to close with here, but uh, again, thanks to everybody who attended. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much.